Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone. Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and I am joined, as always, by the president of Southern Utah University, Scott L. Wyatt. Good morning, Scott. And good morning, Steve. It's always a pleasure to see you, and today we're joined in studio by a special guest. And before I turn it over to you to introduce him, I just want to say I've been in and around academic administration for close to 25 years, and Our guest today is the only one I have ever met that has intercepted a pass by NFL Hall of Famer Troy Aikman. Now, to be fair, Aikman was not in the NFL when he threw that pass. However, I still think that's pretty impressive. So who's our guest today? (laughs) So we we welcome Dr. Brad Cook. He is the provost uh, at Southern Utah University. And uh, welcome, Brad. We're happy you joined us. Thank you, President. Thanks, Steve, for having me here. So, Brad, you've already been, t- been introduced as a football star. <laughs> so why don't you tell us uh, your academic background? Tell us um, what your majors were and degrees. That's kind of fun. Yeah. So I was one of those students um, that uh, couldn't make up their mind. and I think it was um, pretty late in my junior year where I decided to um, major in international relations. <laughs> Uh, I had some sort of vague idea to you know, work for the State Department or in diplomacy or something, but I grew up overseas as a kid, so I, I was very interested in things particularly related to the Middle East. Um, I grew up in the Middle East, uh, grew up in Saudi Arabia as a kid, so it was a very defining period, and so in college I ended up sort of migrating, gravitating to those subjects that related to that part of the world. So by the time I was um, a senior at Stanford, I sort of had enough credits to sort of put together with in international <laughs> relations just as, as, a, as sort of a, an accident because I had to sort of, you know, had to decide on a, on a major and with the, with the courses that I had taken. But I had mostly had driven my academic experience by individual interest more than anything specific in the end in terms of a career. Uh, I ended up staying at Stanford and, and finishing a master's degree in social sciences of education, which in itself is also a very liberal um, sort of way to sort of understand uh, education. And again, I focused my research and my writing on on education systems in the Middle East. And then uh, a, a doctorate uh, in Middle East studies, uh, focusing on uh, looking at the role of of public higher education in Egypt. So I spent a lot of my uh, academic career um, as, a, as a graduate student, as a doctoral student, doing field work in, in Cairo, Egypt, and a lot of time on university campuses uh, in, in and around Cairo. So um, I, in, I guess in a way, a, a bit of a, 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 a billboard for the liberal arts, <laughs> uh, well, and the school that you studied at in England is a small, obscure place <laughs> that's been around for more than 800 years. It was uh, funny. Oxford, I think. Yeah. University of Oxford. So here's an interesting story. Um, when I was there, they were considering uh, putting together a, uh, a law school. Um, no, sorry, a, a business school at, at Oxford. And the debate was... Um, they didn't want to have a business school because they didn't want to, to have vocational or technical education. <laughs> at Oxford. They do now have a business school, but yeah. but that was kind of how um, sometimes out of touch <laughs> places like Oxford could be. Well, let's let's jump into this um, these words that are interesting, uh, particularly interesting in America today, and those are the words that comprise liberal arts. And I think they're really confusing to people. English is one of those languages where words have multiple meanings. 
And when one of the meanings of the word has a certain connotation, it's hard to use the word in any sense without that troubling connotation, good or bad, uh, imposing on all other meanings of the word. So what does it mean to be, what, is, what does the word liberal mean? Yeah. So there, there are probably th- at least three dimensions of that we probably need to unpack. Um, there are there are liberal arts, which typically relates to certain types of disciplines. So the liberal arts major, so English, sociology, anthropology, like the Democrat history. Party and the Green Party and <laughs> those <laughs> kinds of things. <laughs> yeah, this is where this is where confusion reigns. I think is uh, the term liberal has been quite politicized, but uh, but there are the liberal arts, which relate to disciplines. Don't There's have any relationship to politics. No relation to politics at all. Then there's liberal education, which really sort of connotes a broader set of skills, right? Sort of, you know, uh, a broad-based uh, transferable skill set. So, you know, communication and critical thinking and, you know, uh, ethical reasoning and all of these sorts of things that, that an education, a liberal education can pr- provide. And and in, in, a, in, a, in a way... How it started out, though, um, the term actually goes back to the Greeks, that when it was talked about as a liberal education, really was about education for those that were free. What is the proper education for those that weren't slaves? Um, and, you know, often when I, I speak to students and parents about trying to understand or wrap their head around the term liberal in this sense, with a small L, let's, let's emphasize, is think about it this. If I were an employer, if I were your employer, for example, and I was considering giving you a raise, would you want me to be liberal with my raise or conservative with my raise? Now, that's not a political statement. That is essentially just, you know, one that is liberally given, right? Um, but I think that especially in the Midwest and Intermountain West, um, Often when we bring up the term liberal arts or liberal education, it immediately connotes a political position of some stripe or, or another. And being in a very conservative part of, this, of the, the country, often that term is very problematic uh, and often stops the, th- the thinking stops right there. In other words, it's, it just is, is biased by its, by its term. Uh, Steve, you were talking about a Gallup poll. Yeah, the... Uh, there's a Gallup poll recently where the title of the article in which it's cited is is literally higher education drop the term liberal arts. The the folks at Gallup decided to poll and it's a it's a large sample size and they said you you just have a branding problem. This and is a national poll. It is and employers employers actually really like what the liberal arts do, what they add to a student's education and to their life, but this terminology is killing you. This this branding that you have is killing you because liberal means all of the politically charged things that we've talked about, and the word arts simply means, and I can say this with all due respect to my colleagues, <laughs> that you're never going to make a living, right? I mean, I want to be an artist means... Uh, a big sad trombone in the in the heads of moms and dads everywhere because you know my son is going to live in the basement forever uh, is what getting a degree in the arts means. So liberal arts uh, quickly brings into some people's minds, or enough people that uh, Gallup poll found that it was a real issue, enough people's minds that this is political and non remunerative. Right. I do know some very well-paid musicians. I do too. Uh, yeah, I, I've I've always been able to make a living as a musician. In fact, when I was a department chair, I, I, I answered two questions constantly, and one of them was a mother and father or or family member would bring a, a child to say we're planning to come here next year or in another couple of years, but will you please please tell our son or daughter that they cannot make a living as a musician. And I would always say, no, I, I'm sorry, I can't. I, I know lots of people that make a living as a musician. Nice I can't living. guarantee that yours will, but uh, I know lots of people that yeah. that make actually a fairly prosperous living as a musician. 
or other artists. So when we on a university campus talk about the liberal arts, we we aren't talking about um, politics, and we're not talking about um, painting or singing. Right. Even though that might be included, we're talking about something different. We're talking about an education that is, as you mentioned, Brad, liberally given, broadly given, that uh, gives students a foundation to pursue a whole variety of careers, to develop the skills that will help them be successful. Uh, What do you think the most important skills employers are looking for that are really well delivered by what we might describe as liberal arts majors. Yeah, you, you know, I've, you and I have been in, in um, industry advisory board meetings, and these are boards that we, we, we bring in an industry uh, specialist to advise us on our majors and our curriculum. And we'll ask them as a university, how can we best serve you and your, your company? And <clears throat> and the uh, these employers will say, well, you know, we need certain technical skills and we need more engineers. But very quickly, the follow up with, but you know what we really need? <laughs> you know, we need employers that can problem solve. You know, we need employers that can, we need employees that can write. Um, employees that have oral, you know, oral communication skills. That, that sort of, you know, critical thinking. Others can look at a problem and and think through um, these issues to, to problem solve. Uh, they, they often talk about how they need to have employees that are good at synthesizing new ideas, uh, asking good questions, working in teams, and having good ethical judgment. Uh, being, you know, they want people who are curious, right? They want people to add value to the company. Um, and so these are all skills that are part of a liberal education. This is, this is the primary goal of a liberal education, yet, um, uh, yet, yet w- once we call it that, um, it, it, it often um, you know, creates consternation. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. I, I spent um, time going around talking to employers um, in southern Utah, and I remember one visit that really quite surprised me, I was sitting in a maintenance facility at a mine because uh, they were giving us a tour, and the person I was talking to, in answer to my question, what can we do to help prepare people to come work for you, said, um, what I really want you to do is help people learn how to become leaders because everyone I hire, whether it's a custodian, a mechanic, Whatever it might be, I'm hiring a future manager. And I want everybody that comes here to have these kind of skills that you just described, Brad. I was in another um, mine and had the same question. And, and he says, well, we need them to know welding. That's important. But we can help them develop some expertise in welding. And we need them to be able to do this and to do that. But, but what we're struggling with is um, our maintenance people need to be able to read really complex materials. Um, We need really smart people. Um, We don't want any grease monkeys. We want intelligent people who can think, who can read, who can understand, who can problem solve, and and at the same time can do welding and those kinds of things. That was really interesting. And I think that, that those individuals would have considered themselves politically very conservative, but what they were asking me for was a liberally trained person. And if I would have said to them, oh, you want somebody trained in the liberal arts, they would have said, oh, no, that's not what I said. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. confused. But it's, it takes too much time to, to um, argue about terms. It, we, we focus really on the goal. The goal is, is not to convince anybody of term is right or wrong. The goal is is to teach those things that lead to success and happiness for students. Well, one way to think about this, um, and, and we talk about it here on our campus, um, as a T-shaped education, 
right? We're the Thunderbirds, so it's a, it's a T-shaped education. And if you think about the, the shape of a T, you have sort of this, uh, you have two crossbars, right? You've got a, you have a bar that goes across, which, is, which represents sort of the broad-based transferable skill sets that we're trying to uh, give to a, a student. And these are all sort of the liberal education um, pieces that we're talking about. But that's not to diminish sort of the disciplinary depth that also employers are looking for. And so let's take accounting. Uh, we want to have, I mean, people want to have accounting who accounting majors and accounting employees who know accounting. So there's a disciplinary depth there that's important. But what industries really want are accountants that not only are disciplinary, um, uh, competent, and, and, and deep, but have these other types of skill sets that you're talking about. So the one duty I think we have as a, as a, as a university is to attend to both. But, but it's often that, that broad-based T, um, along the T uh, axis there, that, that there's an awful lot of the confusion and uh, the hand-wringing when we use the word. But it is, I think, really important for an educated person uh, to have uh, skill sets, right, that, that are employable, uh, employee, employable um, but over a career, Right, so we're not talking about just the first job. Uh, our responsibility as universities is to think about someone's career over the course of a lifetime, that they have skill sets that are going to serve them well when they change careers multiple times. And the data is very clear that, that people will change. Students will change their careers four, five, six times in a lifetime. And it would be a disservice to them if we were siloing them in very narrow skill sets. So that when technology changes or the workplace changes, uh, then they're going to be unemployed because they, they, you know, they, they had a skill set that a, now a machine can take over. So we have to think about the future. And, and one statistic that just blew me away, and this, was, this came from the Economic World Forum, that would say that, 60, that, 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 uh, that, state that 65% of students entering primary school today will be employed in jobs that do not currently exist. That 65% are going to be employed in jobs that we don't even know about right, right. now. How can we possibly So how prepare? can we do that? And yeah. I think part of that is, is creating these transferable uh, skill sets, these um, flexibility of mind, these higher order thinking skills that um, students are going to need no matter what they're working or what they're doing. AAC and U um, did a survey just recently where they found that 93% of employers are more concerned with someone they're interviewing for a job, more concerned that that individual has critical thinking skills, problem-solving skills, written and oral communication skills, than they are with this, with this person's major. That's really quite interesting. Um, and, and I read a study recently on, in Forbes magazine that said only 20%, 27% of college graduates are working in a field that is related to their major. Wow, that's low. That is incredible. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, I look at my kids, and that's true for them. And it's true for me um, that we're working in fields different than what our majors were. You know, where I first heard that T-shaped student that Brad was referring to is in a, a book called Is There Life After College by a writer named Jeffrey Salingo. I really like his stuff. Here's an ad for Jeffrey Salingo. But, <laughs> but I think he's a really, uh, a really great writer about uh, issues in higher education. And, and where he stumbled across that term was at IBM. And he went and interviewed the man that runs all of IBM's incoming employee training. And they spend more than a billion dollars a year training people in the, quote, IBM way so that they are IBM-ready employees when they finish that initial training. And the man in charge said, we used to look for I-shaped people. We used to look for the people that knew the very, very most about their particular area. And about 15 years ago, we started to shift away, and now we're almost entirely looking for T-shaped people, people can, who can work with others, people who have not only great 
great skills that represent that center column of the T, but they also have some pretty significant, uh, you know, a crossbar to reach into other areas. And, and you're absolutely right. You, your training is as an attorney and now you're the, the president of a university. Did you receive undergraduate training and graduate school training that prepared you to be the president of the university, despite the fact that they thought you were being prepared to be an attorney instead? No, but there probably are some people that say, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> no, I think that... Um, but your undergraduate is in philosophy. Is my that undergraduate right? was in philosophy and econ. I had a dual major. But those those two majors combined um, really helped me to analyze and to think and to be able to read things and understand uh, people of different views. And um, I, I am grateful for those um, majors. I've never regretted it for a minute. They've been really helpful to me. They made you more T-shaped. Oh, then. yeah, they were spectacular yeah. for me. But then I found myself, uh, in uh, when I was an attorney, I found myself always trying to, because I was doing trial work, and I'd have an expert witness who was a psychologist, and then I'd have an expert witness who was uh, a physician, then an expert witness that was a crime scene analyst. And, and I had to, to learn as much as I could about each of these people's professions, you know. And and um, and it was, it was more it, it was more easily done with a broad basis. Brad, you've, you've been working on um, something that you call badges. Yeah, di- digital badges. Talk, talk about um, how this shapes out this T. Yeah. And then what it is. So we were really impressed um, at the university by a study by Burning Glass. It's a, it's a think tank um, that... <clears throat> indicated that that liberal arts majors in particular could make um, a, a significant more a significant percentage of more salary if they had um, some sort of um, identifier to employ to employers that they had some sort of technical or vocational elements in addition to their liberal arts degree so if, for example a history major having a a a digital badge or a certificate of, of sorts, um, somewhere between nine and twelve credits, that they could could add uh, to their CV. Often now, you know, CVs and resumes go out to employers in a digital form, and so when employers pull it up digitally, uh, there can be this digital badge, which once clicked on, will show that in addition to the degree that they have, they have nine to twelve credits in cybersecurity or in uh, social media, or in technical writing, or in technical communications, what that helps is augment right these degrees with very specific skill sets. Now that helps employers connect very quickly to what a student can do in addition to their degree. Um, and I think this is this is a, a critical thing. And I think it's a it's something that the the country is moving towards is what's called micro credentialing or stackable credentialing, right? Where you know students can stack on. Uh, their, uh, their in their educational experience, um, competencies and skills in which make them that much more marketable. But it, but a secondary element of this that attracted to me is that this is maybe in a way in which we can we can actually encourage students to stay in these really valuable disciplines, right? That, like philosophy, that give these these skill sets that we've talked about to students, um, so that they aren't discouraged away from moving into some of these uh, some of these fields because you know that they can do a digital badge option within the 120 credit hours of their bachelor's degree so we aren't asking them to ex- extend time to graduation or, or add additional cost to, because they can do it within the the electives of their major but come away with a degree in philosophy but also have a digital badge say in technical writing or in social media or one of these other or you know computer science or networking or something like this and um, and so we're really excited right that that uh, that students are going to have this option and we're finding them actually more valuable to students than the minor um, because the minor uh, one it has more 
credits that's required, but also it's very disciplinary based. So often a liberal arts student will have a degree in English, but then have a minor in something like anthropology or ethnic studies or something. And that doesn't help employers get their mind wrapped around immediately as to what this person can do uh, when they, when they, on the first day of the job. So then at SU, you were trying to take this idea of this broadly based, liberally given uh, version of education and then infuse it with little mini majors that students can opt to take that are much more specific, much more career focused, or at least skills based focused um, than, than they might get in that, in that broader educational context. Yeah. And in the inverse, right? you think about our, our engineering students or you know, our, our business students, they can also get badges that perhaps have a liberal arts element to them, right? So what we want are engineers that perhaps could get a digital badge in critical thinking, right, or uh, in problem solving or in um, technical writing, right, right. Uh, or, or something like this. That, you know, because we want to have uh, even our science, our STEM students, to have augmentation of their education to make them more productive. And yes, so it I've, works both ways. I've always thought, because you thought that was the that was the little blind spot that STEM, the big push for STEM education actually has, is that, as you said, employers will say as the very second thing out of their mouth, yes, we need these technical skills, but we also want them to write well. We also want them to present well. We also need them to have managerial skills or team building skills. And all of those things tend to be more towards the liberal arts education part of what they would do. So, so taking a STEM student and giving them the opportunity to be a, a better writer or to be a better communicator in some way that I think that's I think that's a terrific option uh, and would make them much more uh, interesting to a prospective employer you've been listening to solutions for higher education today's topic has been part one of a discussion about the importance of a liberal education join us again next week for part two of this same conversation with Dr. Brad Cook the provost of Southern Utah University thanks for listening bye-bye Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.